All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming uh, to the uh, TR069 uh, meeting and uh, OpenWRT. Uh, as, uh, just as a reminder, this meeting is recorded. Uh, we posted on YouTube after the fact for the people that uh, couldn't make the meeting. Um, just a, a quick agenda. Uh, it, I think we will, uh, it's pretty basic, uh, introductions, if obviously if you haven't done introductions or haven't been here before, uh, the face-to-face -face meeting preparation um, for just kind of the things, what people think we need to figure out and, and have get ready beforehand. Uh, we're gonna finish the presentation from Luca and Felix, and then we'll do, uh, we'll go through the presentation. <laughs> Somebody, uh, yeah, needs to mute their line for the feedback. Um, and then we'll just do the presentations from uh, Soft at Home, ADB, and other attendees. That's actually a good chance to remind me, you know, it, it, or just to ask, uh, you know, everyone there to, you know, consider muting your lines if uh, when you're not speaking because we can get feedback and things like that. Um, no worries, though. Um, do we have anyone here who's who who wasn't at the last meeting? All right. Well, we don't have to do introductions then. Um, the face-to-face uh, -face meeting preparation. Um, I guess the first thing is is really what do we need to know before before we get there? Obviously. Uh, it, it's coming up very quick. That's June 28th and 29th. So I guess the questions are, there, uh, there certainly are some things we need to know or to have prepared or um, anything like that. What do people feel, you know, that we need to talk about as a group and what do we, what do we need to get done? All right. Um, any any sense of you know do, does the does uh, the code for the there or the you know any sort of uh, I mean Felix and, and Luca do you think there's some sort of code that you would like to be able to see beforehand? I don't know the feasibility of that of the other um, uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much uh, time or effort will take to other parties involved, like to get permissions to share the code. So it's not yeah. up, up to us, at least with regards to that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think Harry, if it's possible. Uh, I... Yeah, that, that's quite like I wanted just to add that my proposal was at first during the face-to-face -face meeting to discuss about the actual requirements that that we can define for the software framework for data models and the TR69 pro protocol itself before you know discussing about the actual solutions. Usually it's much easier to converge if there are several possible uh, options. Mm -hmm. If at first we define the requirements, this is usually something that we can agree more easily and then to analyze different options and solutions, it's always good to have, you know, a set of requirements and to check the different options against the requirements. That, that was my point. I, I, I think that's... Uh... I think that's that's pretty reasonable. I think to the, the the loose agenda which I've put there, and those are very um, very loose. Uh, it is we should add that just the, the you know setting the requirements. What what is what are the requirements for what works in uh, OpenWRT and uh, what will work for industry, and uh, seeing what where those uh, converge. Um, so, I mean, I, I, did you, I, this is Sally, so, um, 
for this new work which we are starting, do we have any operators specified requirements on uh, on this multi management framework or uh, which annexes of PR69 and those things? Because PR69 is used and you have a lot of uh, uh, annexers and uh, specific things like XMPP support and those things. So I, I second Bostek what he said, brought that all the requirements we need to consider which ones are must have, which ones are good to have or nice to have, and then we take it from there. Okay. I, seems reasonable to me. Any other thoughts yeah. on that? Oh. Well, I think um, uh, I definitely agree that having the requirements is, uh, is pretty important, but to be able to get anywhere, we should also be able to... Uh, discuss specific code approaches and looking at existing implementations will definitely help figure out which are the ideas that turned out well and which are the ideas that ended up making the code a lot bigger than it needs to be or a lot more complex than it needs to be. So I do, I do think that comparing the code and the existing implementations as a, is very useful for this discussion as well aside from just the requirements. Yeah, um, if I may say a few things. So uh, this is Dirk Kvetons from Technicolor. Um, yeah, I agree with Felix there. Um, I think it would be useful if everybody who has actually implemented a stack that is running in the field that have experience with that, that they highlight a few things of the the problems that they uh, occur, uh, bumped into with operators and so on, that they can explain how they solve this in their architecture. Because I think that's very useful to know before you start uh, implementing a new uh, a new uh, architecture. So uh, I I think from our side we have quite some experience there in uh, weird uh, requirements and and uh, or how we solved certain TR69 requirements uh, on OpenWRT. I think if we can explain and share that kind of information, I think that would be quite useful and. That should be a good start before we start discussing about how to uh, add NXK uh, support to the to the whole mix because uh, I think that's uh, uh, somewhere in the future. Uh, the, what I can say on on that is uh, at some point in time it will be obviously uh, important to have a look at the solutions, but. I'm just afraid that we, if we start to define the requirements by looking at the solutions, uh, it will the, the solutions can be considered as requirements. And this is something that I wanted to avoid by suggesting to discuss it first about the requirements and not the solutions. So uh, if somebody has a real uh, life experience regarding the solutions, I suppose that he should be able to define a few uh, requirements, and then we can discuss them. And uh, if we just start by, by looking at the solutions, then we will discuss whether this solution should be a requirement or not. And for me, you know, if there is a requirement for something, you, you can imagine uh, several different solutions. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that uh, one solution is better than the another one if both uh, fulfill the requirement. So usually the my experience in this kind of uh, groups is that you must it are several potential options. It's better to agree at first on the requirement independently of the solutions. If we mix both, uh, it will be a hard work, I'm afraid. But, but I think that you probably want to have both activities in parallel because, uh, you know, there's uh, people like Felix who are excellent developers, but he's he's not responsible for maintaining a carrier grade TR69 implementation. And yet, uh, you know, he knows OpenWRT inside and out and <clears throat> the range of platforms and I don't think it's bad to have people looking at technology solutions in parallel with other people who are coming up with requirements. I think you can do both. 
I think can be quite useful. Is that to we don't have with, enough uh, people to do both in parallel. I don't think it takes more people. I uh, I think uh, it makes sense to ha at least have some uh, requirements only discussion at at the start to be able to uh, focus on what's really important in all of this and whatnot. But I think when it comes to making more specific decisions about specific requirements uh, to be able to get a sense of what consequences uh, those those decisions lead to, it's good to look at existing implementations or at least the existing experience in having built such implementations and, and deployed them just to make and sure that, that whatever we come up with actually has a reality check. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. I, I agree with this approach that for okay. some requirement, it can be something that we cannot, you know, uh, resolve uh, it during the, the discussions and that some uh, further analysis, including the source code, will be necessary. I fully agree that it can happen. But for some others, I don't think that we have uh, systematically have a, a, any... Um, any requirement for, for looking at, at the solution. So uh, I would suggest to go as far as possible without looking at the solutions. And if there are some points, some requirements, uh, where it makes sense to have a look at the, at the actual uh, existing solutions, then this is something that we note and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, do that in, in the second stage. Yeah, and also I think it might be different for uh, for all the participants in there. I mean, for me personally, as having as much as code uh, as pos as much code as possible available ahead of time uh, can can help a lot since I'm quite fast at reading code and figuring out the architecture from it. But I fully realize that not everybody wants to uh, be involved in discussions on the existing solutions. But I I do think it's a it's a pretty useful. Uh, guideline to have available the the base of experience so i don't think we should we should exclude something like that it just it may not be a part of the discussion that everybody wants to wants to participate in but it's important nonetheless all right so i i think what what i'm hearing generally is that and and you know someone can correct me if i'm wrong is that we need to have a um, perhaps I don't want to say short, but but you know a, a pretty quick uh, requirements, just basic requirements gathering um, at at the meeting, and then we need to start looking at um, you know once we have the the kind of the basics requirements, start looking potentially at at what requirements do we need and what and how do those requirements um, relate to the code that already exists? And then how do we actually relate that to whatever is going to be created? And, uh, you know, that that in and of itself is not entirely, um, it's still a little, a little uh, up in the air because it's, you know, it's, um, we don't totally have that locked down yet, I don't think. Um, does, does that seem reasonable to everyone that that seems to be kind of the way pe people are are going or i'm fine with that awesome okay and, I, and I, I, oh go ahead was, sorry so um i don't know if anybody is on the call from broadband forum group but uh, i didn't know until uh, last call that there was some new spec under the way i don't know how they call it i think they call it a bit differently so what would definitely be useful to either uh, have a peek of that uh, new specification uh, or somebody who is already involved with this work of the new specification to be present. Um, because uh, if, if they are going to have something new, just to see how different it is, so we can like include it into the design and discussion and so forth. Uh, look at, uh, for me, uh, the, the new uh, TR69 version 2 or whatever the name uh, uh, BBM uh, gives to that. Uh, this is a kind of nice to have requirement, which means for me that this is something that 
can be added later. So that actually the requirement saying that we must be able to have, you know, several uh, front ends, et cetera, because there are also some discussion about changing the, the protocol itself, okay? Uh, so if we have a solution that is able to support several different protocols, that's also a part of the answer. What I would like to uh, suggest is uh, when we discuss about the requirements, the, the requirements have also been attached to some timeline. In other words, uh, it, it will be great to have at some point in time uh, an implementation for for the new versions of the stuff but today none of the big service providers uses uh, this new uh, new things okay they have so many problems with the existing ones that they are not so keen to change anything uh, so one day we will need to to support the new stuff but this is not uh, something that we absolutely need, need just now so that's a, a requirement for me that should be placed uh, in some point uh, in the future. I okay. agree that this is something that's uh, that may still be a little off, but uh, I think in terms of when, when we when we make actual design decisions and what we want to come up with, it's absolutely important to consider that now. We don't need to yeah. implement a lot of code I for agree. it. But it's something if we if we make decisions that ignore those parts, uh, then we'll end up creating a lot more work for ourselves and a, a lot more uh, compatibility breaking changes in the future. I fully agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that I think all that makes sense. One one thing you know, and um, and thing something where you know, and this is with with any software project, it gets easy to start to think in. Um, you know, in the, you know, you guys don't need me to tell you this, but it, it's like the, it's always nice to kind of, you know, come up with the with the ultimate solution right away, and and um, definitely that you know this is going to be iterative over time and adding new things and and getting better. So it's like, um, it's just always good to keep that in mind. Um, something like that, but okay. Uh, any other discussion? So, so oh, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, just a couple of points to add. So, is this TR69 is operators deployed uh, uh, management solution? So, it is good to uh, collect their inputs upfront on how they they see the current TR69 or upcoming one, like the new USP, which I at, I also go to broadband forum and I keep track of them. So that is to uh, enhance uh, uh, current TR69 to also do control and go through this uh, smart home kind of requirements where you not only do doing configuration, but you are doing some control kind of things, which is missing into the current TR69. And there could be multiple controllers, like a sort of mini ACS, which you could do through apps or this kind of thing. And there are these aspects, which uh, the new specifications is focusing. On the other hand, we have lightweight protocols like NetConfiang, which is preferred for deep use management and those things, which is which is uh, another alternative coming from the IETF world. And we have this BBF world, the uh, TRS plan as well as its successor. So, uh, if we if we could collect some upfront requirements of um, uh, uh, operators' needs, then it would be a good a starting point to focus on what they need, because ultimately we are bringing this solution which can be deployed, right? So I just think on these lines and uh, uh, not sure uh, because the time is short, but if we could collect this, it would be helpful. I fully agree on that, that what, what we really need are the requirements from the service providers. And uh, I'm currently uh, trying to organize the presence of, of some guys from Orange to, to our face-to-face -face meeting uh, to provide this kind of input too. That, that's great, yeah. I mean, is there anyone else who feels that, uh, um, obviously it's it'd be great to have, a, you know, it'd be nice to have a survey or something, but that may not be feasible in, in, 
you know, a week and a half. Uh, is there, does anyone else have, have any suggestions on ways to, or, or will take on like the, you know, kind of like actually getting some of those requirements or have the ability to get some of those requirements? Or, I mean, the other thing is obviously a lot of everyone here, a lot of people here work with these carriers regularly, so they may know the requirements as is. I, I don't know. Well, I'm, my name is Michael Richardson. I'm uh, attending on behalf of Fine Pint Technology. We're actually on the other side, on the server side. We sell to those carriers. Um, so, um, to some extent, we, we the more the more that the more that TR sixty nine is supported out there, the more we'll sell to carriers, right? Um, who don't always want to uh, um, get in bed with a single uh, uh, CPE vendor. Um, so. I'm not the expert on it, but I've been trying to get our guy who does do that to to get involved in this stuff. So if you have questions like that, I can certainly. Uh, um, I think that that Bill Murphy could could absolutely shed a lot of light on that in terms of what's really important and what's perhaps less important and what's really cool and would be nice to have. That I I think that'd be very helpful. Uh, um. Uh... Yeah, anything you can do to to help us help us get more information on that would be very helpful. Thank you. All right. Um uh any other discussion on on this topic or do we do we feel good about where we are? Um anything else that people feel we need to talk about related to the face-to-face -face meeting now? All right. Um, I guess one summary is what what one thing I heard from from Felix is is it would be uh, nice to have as much code as available. And I can obviously understand that that in a week and a half there's a lot of approvals and things like that. So um, I think I don't think it's wrong to say that it would be helpful to uh, Felix and and Luca to to know that as to be able to see it as much as possible. Um, you know when the point of the meeting comes that we really need to start looking into what's there. So, um, yeah. All right. Um, I just, we're going to move into presentations. Uh, if, as long as it's okay with Felix and Luca, we can, we can go through the rest of their presentation and then we can move on to, uh, the soft at home ADB and any other presentations we have. So, uh, Luca and Felix, do you do you know where we were uh, offhand in the presentation? Um, I personally think we can probably continue with uh, Luca's part on the kind of work that he wanted to do, uh, because obviously there's going to be a lot more discussion and a lot more exchange about the different approaches uh, in the face-to-face -face meeting, and I'm not sure uh, it's useful if I resume that part right now. Okay, sounds good. Um, um, you can go to page 14. I'm not sure what I can't see the page. Number. Oh, uh, there. next one there. Next. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of bit technical discussion now, um, but definitely once we start, uh, working on the implementation or using, uh, some other implementation and so on, we will need, uh, ACS server for testing. So I'm glad that we have on the call uh, somebody from the other side. Uh, but I was thinking that uh, it would be definitely good that we have open source uh, implementation of an ACS, which we can really use just for uh, testing. So when we started working on um, TR069 implementation, uh, we found it really convenient to have like a bunch of scripts which we used for testing. And also when we worked on uh, NetConf Yang, then we didn't have any test infrastructure at all. So based on that experience, I would like uh, that we do something like uh, it says here on the bullets and I'm going to read it. Um, so proper solutions so we can fast test changes fast uh, and that we also can run some tests in the loop. Uh, so for like production use case, so we leave it um, that the test server is running for, I don't know, a day or two. 
What also would be interesting, um, and that is something that I need to look more deeply at, is maybe a board farm integration. So, for example, when you change something on a device, that you actually can really check on a real device that it is changed. Okay. Uh, also, this kind of solution we can use for black box testing of uh, any implementation. And then, uh, if it makes sense, we can make some comparison uh, graphs like, uh, okay, um, today we have this much of performance. Uh, after one month, we have these performance improvements or, or not, right? And we can also like test, uh, show very, uh, in a graphical way, how, I don't know, two different devices uh, compare with the same implementation and so on. And also what we can uh, show whether some device um, does the implementation by the book, for example, uh, throw it some uh, wrong messages or something that is not in the standard and then clearly point out to the developer or person who is testing it so this can be fixed. So any questions maybe or points uh, so far? Um, yeah, last week we had uh, somebody on the call from QA Cafe, uh, Jason, mm -hmm. I didn't catch the last name. Um, yes. And um, QA Cafe actually has a CD router, CD router uh, test suite for TR69. Um, I know. His, uh, his last name was a lot, Jason. Uh, yes, I don't remember last name, but yes, it was Jason. Um, yeah. It's not, I don't know if you have this. Does anybody on the call has this uh, solution? Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we use this QA Cafe. We also use this, and a broadband forum uses this QA Cafe CD router for you know, certifying the TR69 clients. So even if we test with something else, they have a certification program, BBF.69. And uh, it's available for public. I mean, any of us could go and see this. And they, these has been certified by testing with QA Cafe CD router. Uh, yes, oh, okay. So, to my knowledge, this uh, was a solution that they were selling, right? So it was not as easy to get to get it. No, it's a hardware appliance, even. So it's really a hardware box. You have to. Uh, hang into a rack somewhere and connect it to your devices and so on. So it's not easily to use. Uh, and it's also, as mentioned, it's more for compliance testing and so on. If you really want more like an interactive test of your, of your device, then I think CD router is not that useful for that. I, I would tend to agree. We have a setup like that as well, and it's not that easy indeed. Uh, on the other hand, considering that people from the broadband forum were interested in this and their certification program uh, with the University of New Hampshire actually uses CD router, it might be relevant uh, to the discussion to see whether they would be willing to donate that or contribute or help or... Definitely. That that sounds, that'd be a great idea, I think. Yeah, I, I fully agree because uh, their solution is definitely proven in the field. Uh, what my aim with this was uh, more that we have something in the open so anybody can like download the code, uh, try it out and set it up on their own. But um, yeah, if we agree that we will use our own theirs, I'm okay with that. Okay. Uh, so, I, uh -huh. Luca, I think we need also something for the open source community because this CD router is pretty expensive. Um, so nothing one would buy when you are not a company with money. <clears throat> so when for your daily testing, I think uh, at least if we don't get free licenses for CD router or some something reduced cost so I think we still need something for your daily testing um, to see if this new feature works or not and so on mm -hmm. okay so this is definitely something that we can discuss uh, later on uh, in any case we all agree that we need something like this so to test it with the other side 
uh, of the connection, right? So be it uh, something new or uh, reuse existing, it's something that is definitely needed. Okay. Um, any more points? Okay, then I think we have one more uh, point, and that is the documentation part. Okay. One more slide, please. Yeah. Okay. So, what we really should have is a good documentation, right? So, when I made the slides uh, with Felix, um, certain, uh, how to say, um, ideas came to mind, okay? And um, so we do need to have like normal software documentation where we define the API and so on. But what we have something uh, here uh, specific, I see now that we don't have a bullet, so I'm going to talk about it, is that um, each device can have a different parameter supported, right? Depending uh, if it has Wi-Fi, then it needs to have Wi-Fi parameter. If it, is, uh, if, if it has a VoIP, then it needs to have VoIP parameters and so on. So what I see here as a challenge uh, is that we need to have like some kind of uh, uh, place where we can uh, put all these different um, links to the relevant code or uh, scripts or wherever. So when somebody wants to build a solution, he can find it uh, easily. Okay, so if I need Wi-Fi, then I need this part. This is from where I can get it. If I need a uh, VoIP, then I need it uh, from this location. If I have VoIP from this vendor, I go in that place. So just to have it in one place, so it's not scattered around or, or, over the internet, uh, and then you have to spend a lot of time in order to um, find the documentation that you need in order to actually build the product. So uh, this is a point that I'd like to make. And uh, what we have been doing recently, I don't know if you heard of this service, as Cinema. It's uh, really cool. Um, it allows you to record your terminal. So I don't know how the other people do the development, but um, the OpenWRT guys uh, tend to like the terminal. So this a cinema tool uh, allows you really easy to record terminal and then like fully uh, easy share it with others and then it's you don't have to waste uh, a lot of time if you like uh, make an error or uh, watch while you are typing. So um, if you want to share with somebody what you did in a terminal, this is a really nice tool. So I just wanted to say it uh, here as well. So yeah, that would be it. Uh, regarding uh, the parts that I think are uh, needed um, with what we said uh, last time and, and here. So, yeah, that's it. Any questions? All right. Uh, well, Thank you, uh, Felix and Luca. I think I think you you know we're you you two are 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 pretty pretty important to this effort. So you know I appreciate uh, everything you've done so far and look forward to continuing to work with you on this. This is great stuff. Um, if it, uh, I guess uh, if there are no questions, then we can just move to the uh, soft at home uh, presentation. Well, that mostly worked. Uh, is there someone here who wants to lead the soft at home one? That would be me, uh, Walter. Awesome. This is, hmm, okay. All right, uh, yeah, this page is just an introduction and I don't think I really need to do that uh, here in the, with the current uh, audience. One relevant thing there is that uh, our implementation doesn't only support uh, TR181 and TR98 uh, for the data model for a gateway. We also use it for a uh, settle box deployment, so a device in the LAN behind a gateway. So we also support TR106. And this is uh, just configurable in the in the code. 
well, in at, at runtime actually even. Uh, so we can skip to the next slide, I think. Okay, the basic principle isn't that different from anything we've seen before. Uh, there is the, uh, the CR69 implementation that you see on the right hand side inside the, uh, the rubber box, uh, which terminates the, uh, the protocol uh, the, and communicates with the ACS. We have a data model translation layer that is a bit different in, in, uh, in how it works, but it does use this, but it's basically the same concept of being able to say that, well, we speak TR69 uh, on one side, and on the other side, we talk to uh, our module, software modules via an interprocess communication. And then you have the, uh, the, the blocks with a P are, are plugins, the blocks with a C are clients. It's a picture of our own system bus from our software. So we're not using UBus or DBus. Uh, we predate, uh, our bus is called PCB, it predates UBus. And it's somewhat similar to in, in logic to both DBus and UBus. And um, the P are the plugins, so you might you will have a voice application and a TR-104 mapper that goes towards that. We will have a, for, uh, a firewall and a TR-98 and a TR-181 mapper to that. We have a, a wireless LAN implementation and a TR-98 and well, it's only a TR-181 mapper to that because the TR-98 data model for wireless is not that good. Uh, we have clients, which are other applications locally on the bus as well. As well. Fundamentally, there's no big difference with, the, uh, with everything else you've seen so far, except that what's interesting is that the connection between the TR69 uh, client and the mapper is actually just a bus like any other. So it's also a PCB system bus. So um, I think it was Felix who pointed out that, well, on this interface, to the mapper, he could he would have a command line interface, and you could interface with that and look at what is offered locally on the box as a developer. Uh, what is offered to the ACS for us, it's just a matter of connecting to a different IPC socket, and you see the bus from that side. You could have applic client applications listening on the, on it directly uh, on that side and interacting with this. Uh, it's it's nicely symmetrical in concept. Okay, uh, next page goes deeper into the uh, implementation of it. Um, so that's the internal architecture of the of the CWMPD, the, which is the standard name for a TR69 client. Um, the top of it is the main event loop, and that implements the HTTP server and client uh, side. So you need to have an HTTP server if an ACS says that it wants to contact you, it will do a connection request and say, please contact me back. And then HTTP clients to do the, uh, the actual protocol over it. Below that, there is a uh, SOAP uh, per a protocol termination, both the XML and everything. Uh, below that, there is the actual engine of the TR69 protocol. An important aspect is to be able to do informs. That means that if anything has changed, uh, then you, and for a, of a parameter for which the ACS has a subscription, you need to be able to send a message to the ACS and say, hey, this thing changed, it's important. Um, so it's not, it subscribes on the backend data model to all these different parameters for which it needs to be notified. There are time notifications, so it's got timer logic, there's a bunch of things in there. And then the bottom block is the data model adapter. So that interfaces with the backend bus. Uh, it's modular. It's even a shared library in our implementation, which means that we can replace our PCB implementation with the UBus implementation if that's uh, if that's the right way, the thing to do. It's feasible. It does a bunch of other things, but so there would be some effort, but it's uh, certainly uh, achievable. Okay. Unless if there are any questions, I will, we can go to the next slide. Um, then I try to map what kind of external dependencies you have. So it's not enough to consider that, oh, it's just a mapper, it's a data model interface. There are a bunch of things that you implicitly need to do. Uh, the top couple of things are, the top few things are quite trivial. Yes, you need to be able to log to the local system, you need to do DNS resolution, which we do in a, in a, in a way that prevents any DNS uh, problems uh, from hurting the TR69 client. 
uh, you need to know whether the uh, your RUN interface uh, is up, whether its IP address has changed. You might have multiple IP addresses. You might have an IPv4 address. Uh, all those things. Uh, we fully support IPv6 as well, and I think we're deployed with that too. Um, the RUN topology is uh, tricky as well. Um, so while you can just do a data model mapper to well, here's a PPP over PPPoE session over a uh, over a VLAN over an ATM over Ethernet interface of, on top of an, uh, an ATM VC on top of a an, an ADSL line, for example. Um, you need to do more than that. The uh, ACS will interact with the particular active interface that you're using at that point in time. It's uh, it's an unfortunate part of its design, but it does mean that you need a little bit of intelligence to, to map this through. Um, the time is relevant. There are some tricky bits in starting up in the first startup of a, of a TR69 client where it really needs to know if it's NTP synchronized, and this has some important implications. Um, the firewall, uh, we of course need to, assuming that there is a firewall on the one side interface and everything is closed by default, that means that you need to set up a port to listen to connection requests. Um, you'll see lower down that we also actually need to be able to uh, execute port forwarding. The next bit is the uh, the beef and with what I've seen of uh, the uh, TR69 implementations of the um, uh, the free TR69 implementations in, that exist in OpenWRT already that do support this, which is the device information. Uh, what's your manufacturer and serial number and product time? The things that are really critical for an ACS to identify your box and to do management of which boxes are connected to the network. The software version is relevant in there as well because you also need to basically support software updates. That's what the next slides are about. Uh, then there's a, another tricky bit, which is uh, TR69 Amendment F. It used to be in a separate in TR111. Uh, and that is devices that are on your LAN interface that need to be TR69 managed as well. Uh, there's a standard that says that the standards of broadband forum says that you have to listen to your client, re client uh, request options in the leases of those devices on your DHCPv4 server. That way you pick up that this is a TR69 manageable device. You have to expose that to the ACS in a specific data model. And the ACS will pick it up and it will set up a port forwarding so that it can do connection requests to those devices. Uh, so that means that it needs to have some sort of a picture of the LAN and of those devices, their IP addresses, their MAC addresses, uh, whether they're active or not, and be able to set up port forwardings in the firewall. Those were the um, the most important, um, it, in, almost implicit uh, dependencies on the on the backend system behind the TR69 client that I could uh, that I could think of. Um, any comments or questions? Uh, this is good. Just one question or one comment I had is, uh, BVF publishes those XMLs. Uh, uh, device model, TR181, TR98, and all. So uh, is everything hand-coded here, or do you have any tool to generate this uh, uh, the supported DT uh, device type, uh, and then that is used in this solution? Um, so there is an XML description that is published by the World Platform for all the data models. And uh, as it so happens, I have somebody with me who I think did an implementation of that once. Uh, specifically, the problem was that so we um, we we've had tools to to import the descriptions of the of that XML. Uh, it doesn't really help for setting up the translations. Those in our data model mapper need to be done explicitly. Uh, what we also have seen is that um, have had a, a requirement from the from the our customers who have had the, the ACS is that they consider and this is really an important element that we that we will have to discuss in the, in the requirements uh, discussion as well in the face to face meeting they consider every device and every software version of every model of device as a specific device um, they 
the ACSs will have the ability to say that the data model of that particular device is described and identified based on uh, how the device, uh, via the device information, identifies itself. And they want that type of XML format to import into the ACS to easily map that and to easily write their scripts with. Um, that the, covers not only uh, the whatever subset of the uh, of the broadband forum uh, standard data models that uh, that are implemented, but also the whole list of custom parameters that they typically come up with. Um, I can't remember now if we really finalized that and if we really had the export capability of that. No, we didn't. We can export it actually as a, in various formats, including in XML. So it was, I think, just a matter of applying an XSLT. That's really the only use case that I see for that is the, the export so that you can give your, your data model uh, to an ACS uh, operator in an, uh, in an ISP. Yeah. I, I sure can confirm that, that. Uh, from our experience, uh, we have the same thing, uh, <laughs> that uh, they really want to know which data model parameters you exactly implement and they want to have that in an XML format. So uh, we have the same experience. And we also uh, did implement this kind of tool that we can run on the target itself and it will uh, crawl the, the, the mapping files uh, and extract the exact parameters that are there um, and then generate an XML file for that device. So uh, it's familiar. Yeah, that's exactly how our implementation works as well. The only missing bit is uh, is uh, getting that information which we already have and translating it to the broadband forum format, which is, shouldn't be a big deal. Why I ask is, uh, I, I think thanks for response, why I ask is DR181 is used with several thousand of parameters and objects. So, and on top of that, if we customize with uh, vendor specific extensions, if we have any tool uh, which is running on host to, 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 to give out the the uh, device type DT, then it could be used on the target to give the, uh, without doing this hand coding, which is, which is very tedious in this case. Of course, uh, uh, ACS will ask this uh, uh, get parameter names and get parameter values, and it will get the entire tree. Uh, you are right on those things. So just this host part where we could use the standard published BBF and Run it through some tool, then it may be easier. So that's what I was thinking. Maybe could be a requirement as well. Uh, yeah. Well, from our experience, host tools are not that relevant because we have to support so many devices and so many software configurations that it's usually easier to have a tool on the target uh, and then extract from there what is actually on the target. After all the customizations that have happened uh, in the various stages. So that's, for, that's our experience and how we did it. Um, we do use the XML files published by Broadband Forum. Uh, so we have a tool that reads them and generates the metadata used for, uh, yeah, uh, for loading into our mapping engine. Uh, and then you add the logic to map it to the, ex the exact uh, system parameters. Um, so we do use the XML files. Uh, but we translate, let's say, to our own metadata format that is used at runtime. So, uh, okay, the, thank you. I, I guess I, I may ask a question that that's partly due to my uh, my inexperience in this area, but might be useful for to bring up. I, I guess I'm trying to understand, like, are the translations? reusable between implementations between carriers or how does that well, work? The data, well, there are the broadband forum standards such as TR181 and TR104. Um, those are a guideline for everyone. Uh, the problem is that the way they're defined is not very, um, there are some, uh, it lacks in, uh, in specificity of how it needs to be interpreted. Uh, there are also concepts in, uh, in the data models that require such complicated operations from the ACS side that the people writing those scripts at the operators 
choose to say, well, I'm not going to do that. If I have to go and query 15 different uh, parameters and then calculate a difference and then go and pr create new objects and everything like that, all I want is a simple operation uh, where I write to a custom parameter, this is what you now need to do and implement that uh, in your own uh, logic. That's simply the reality, uh, the, the difference between the standards and the reality. Um, those two factors that the, uh, the specification is a, is a bit vague and that um, not every, well, at least not, nobody we've ever seen really fully respected uh, makes it so that the reusability is limited. We do okay. m do a good effort of trying to educate our customers <laughs> and tell them that if you want to do something custom, please don't. Here's the standard. Can we not please do it via, uh, according to the standard? Because we've also made the effort of our internal implementation on the back end to make it as close as possible to the broadband forum uh, structure, uh, where it's uh, as long as it's technically uh, sensible. But um, at the end of the day, you know, you know what they say about customers, and they pay the bills or they make the rules. <laughs> okay. So, so what I'm what I'm hearing is is this is an area where. Uh, while it'd be ideal if we could, we could, uh, you know, someone could make like one translation and then release it, uh, you know, publicly and, and work together. This isn't an area where you're going to get a ton of that, uh, that network effect where it, 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 there's going to be enough customization that those translation layers are and those translation uh, functions are not going to be um, that reusable. Okay, thanks. Uh, a second aspect is that you might have multiple Im implementations on the backside. So you might say that uh, there are some really esoteric uh, functionalities that are described in PR 181, uh, things that are absolutely, both, there is no standard open WRT implementation of that at all. Uh, so it might very well be that um, several people or several vendors do their own stack and of course, internally uh, on, on UBUS, it doesn't look the same at all uh, as what they've independently implemented, which means that it, whatever PR69 implementation there is, client implementation there is, there has to be some flexibility to map um, whatever front-end data model to also whatever back-end data model. All right, thanks. Just uh, just but before we continue, we're almost at our at at ten o'clock. Do we want to keep going, or do we want to want to cut it here? I have another meeting, but I could certainly continue for, for another five or ten minutes. I don't also prefer that we continue, so we finish at least this presentation. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's I fine. Then. That I don't need. I think I need fine with me. Awesome. Well, we'll keep going then. Sounds good. Okay. Yep. All right. Next slide. Um, right. Uh, file upload and download is another thing that you don't just solve with uh, with data model uh, translation. Uh, so you have to be able to do. CR69 defines file uploads and downloads. So downloads would typically be a firmware upgrade, which of course implies that you have to apply that and reboot the system and everything. Uh, it can be configuration that's uh, uploaded or downloaded to the system, uh, a system log, pushing a new version of a web UI, and then there, those are the standard defined types. And then there are custom file types, which we've used for things such as uh, custom applications, uh, firmware of an, uh, of an embedded piece of uh, an embedded controller that is, uh, that is present, things like that. Um, for firmware update, it's particularly tricky because you need to keep the status that, okay, so you've downloaded the file, then you need to shut down the system, do the firmware update, do the reboot, uh, and then go and report back that, yes, I've successfully transferred the file and this is now my new version. That's uh, it's clearly specified how that needs to be done. And there are all sorts of error conditions that can be reported. So that's a part of it as well. Um, the next page is, I think, the last page. And that just shows uh, what those, how we've implemented that. Um, there is a, um, 
we can do multiple uh, uploads and downloads uh, requests at the same time. There's a, a list of uh, queued file transfers. Uh, so the, uh, the ACS pushes into that, please start this transfer. And then we have external clients to, that can listen on that uh, and see that uh, external applications that can listen on the queue transfers and say that, oh, that looks like a file type that I will handle. So the upgrade daemon will do something else than uh, something like a configuration file upload. That will be the different implementation uh, and a different client handling that. So it updates the status in the queue transfers, which will then uh, be, the, which is how the TR69 client will then communicate the status with the ACS. It will trigger a transfer client to download over typically HTTPS or, or FTP, typically HTTPS uh, nowadays at least. Uh, do whatever it needs to do, and then reports the status back so that the queue transfers item can be closed and the uh, and the results returned back to the ACS. So that's also an, an an internal interface that you don't cover with just with data model mapping. There has to be something managing this list of queue transfers and some sort of an interface to whatever implements the logic behind whatever file type uh, you need to deal with. Um, that's the end of it. All right. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, are there any questions that that uh, people didn't uh, bring up? All right, hearing none, uh, I guess uh, we will uh, we'll get ready to close the meeting. Uh, we'll have a, um, as long as I, it makes sense, we'll have another meeting next week at the same time. And obviously we will uh, we'll be in touch more about the people who said they were going to come to the, uh, the in-person meeting to get you any details that, that you need. Um, um, I have a quick question before, yep. uh, before we leave. Is there uh, some information on like your preferred hotel that people are staying at for the in-person meeting or when people arrive uh, so I can book my flight and everything? Uh, so guys, I will send this information uh, on Monday with, with all the necessary details. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Wojtek. Um, all right. Well, any, anything else that people need to bring up in the next uh, last couple of minutes? Or... All right, sounds good. Well, uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, and a great meeting and we will uh, we'll keep in touch uh, and uh, talk to you again next week. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.